Hello, Colorado Realtors. I'm Scott Peterson. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Legal Bites. Happy New Year to all of you. Uh, many of you won't recognize me probably without my elf, elf costume on. I just took that off a day or two ago. Uh, it was so comfy and I enjoyed it uh, for the holiday season and beyond. Ty Roan finally uh, mentioned that I probably ought to, ought to take the elf costume off and, and get on with my new year. So hope you all are having a great new year. Uh, on today's episode, we're going to be talking about uh, my favorite acronym in the entire world. I love this acronym, and I think you all will, will too, as you say it more and more and more. The Foreign Investment in Real Property Tax Act, or more commonly known as FERPTA. FERPTA, FERPTA, FERPTA. It reminds me of the uh, Marsha, Marsha, Marsha from the Brady Bunch days. Uh, very nice acronym to say. Uh, it's created a, a lot of confusion uh, in the beginning of this year, primarily because it was added to the 2018 version of the four-hour annual commission update course. And it's an important provision uh, to be added. The reason it was added to the update course was because, of course, over the last number of years, Colorado as a state has seen a, a increased, we'll call it foreign investment, or for, uh, investment uh, in real estate from uh, more international corners of the world. Uh, some of our markets are, are more uh, high-profile uh, resort type markets have seen foreign investment for a long time, but the rest of the state is starting to see uh, a lot of foreign investment as well. And so uh, FERPTA is something that uh, we need to be talking about a little bit. But they added it to the ACU, um, and uh, maybe we will be adding it to the uh, Colorado uh, 2019 contract to buy and sell uh, when those revisions come out as of January 1st, 2019. I know there's a, a, a uh, initiative to, to have some, some provision added there. So stay tuned for that. Um, that'll ask the question in a checkbox manner. Uh, do we have, uh, is the seller a, a, a non, uh, a foreign person or a non-citizen essentially? So that's when FERPTA applies. So this is not new regulation. And, and because again, it was put into the ACU this year, uh, I've, I've taught it myself a couple of times and I've had a lot of people reach out and kind of screaming going, you know, how did, how could this all come about? because it's a very interesting tax obligation. FERPTA itself has been around since 1980. It's a, it's, it's, uh, it's a, this is a tax, again, that is paid by a non-citizen uh, in the country who owns uh, American real estate and goes to sell that American real estate. And in that case, 15% is withheld from the purchase price. It's the gross purchase price, the total purchase price of the home. 15% of that is supposed to be withheld. And the reason that FERPTA exists is so that uh, our US Treasury Department can get their hands on the money. Of course, if they don't have a tax ID number, if they're not an American citizen, they're selling real estate here, they do have a taxable event in America, but it's easy for them, and prior to 1980, uh, it, it, would be, it was easy for them just to sort of take all of their gains, and then since they have no legal tangent to the United States, hard for the US Treasury or the IRS to really get their hands on the money, uh, on the money that was created or the taxable event that was created by the sale of that real estate. So Congress uh, created FERPTA in 1980, but here's the wrinkle, as of 1985, if that tax is not withheld, if the buyer who is supposed to be the withholding agent, whoever's buying the property is the withholding agent for that 15%, normally it takes place through the title company, but the buyer is, from a legal standpoint under FERPTA, the withholding agent for that 15%. And if it's not withheld, then the buyer can have a tax liability themselves for the seller's 15% if the buyer does not withhold the 15% that the seller should have withheld or that should have been withheld under FERPTA. So that's been around since 1985. Again, none of this stuff is new, but because it's in the ACU and because we're starting to talk about it quite a bit more, um, there's a lot of people going, whoa, this is crazy. We never, you know, we never knew anything about this. I'm not going to get into a whole bunch of more information on the, uh, on the provisions of FERPTA specifically. I would encourage you, if you haven't yet, to take the ACU this year. It's a fantastic ACU and they talk about some of the provisions related to FERPTA. Uh, you can also go to the IRS website. They've got a lot of information on FERPTA. Or as always, you can call the legal hotline and, and get some more, maybe have a, a more specific direction or focus uh, placed on, on a FERPTA question that you might have. But what I want to talk about are a couple of common questions that have come up quite consistently over the course of this last month. So first of all, there's this document. It's called an Affidavit of Non-Foreign Status. Um, and it basically means, hey, I'm a citizen and on that document, somebody would list, a, if it's a, an, an, an individual, excuse me, they would list their social security number. If it's an entity, then they would list their uh, TIN number, federal tax ID number um, on that and make, an, make a, a statement under penalty of perjury that 
that here is my tax ID number and FERPTA withholding should not occur. That 15% withholding should not occur in the transaction. So that's the typical document. And again, I think it's often proffered by the, the title company. I think it ought to be, um, or it ought to be given to the seller. But hopefully that the, the foreign status question is determined much earlier than just at the closing table. But the actual affidavit itself is often offered by the uh, title company for the seller to acknowledge. So how do you determine US citizenship? Well, you ask. You ask the question, and you offer them uh, offer a seller an ability to sign an affidavit stating that they are a US citizen or that they are uh, not non-foreign. I'm trying to get avoid using too many double negatives here. But they would be providing, essentially, a social security number. I've had some questions related to fair housing concerns on that. And I don't think fair housing is really a concern in this case, because fair housing is, is concerned about um, discrimination in the denial of housing to somebody. So if you were trying to ask the buyer about their foreign status, maybe a little bit different question. But again, this question goes to the seller uh, related to foreign status. And so there's not really the concerns about denial of housing opportunities to a seller because they've already had a housing opportunity and they're just choosing to sell it now. Um, what if the seller refuses to answer or provide their tax ID number? Well, as a buyer, I think uh, I, my concern would be that I would get stuck with that 15% uh, FERP the tax if the seller refused to pay it at some point in time in the next uh, tax filing cycle. And so I would probably uh, mandate that the title company or somebody withhold that 15% from the closing funds for the buyer's protection. Um, who holds the funds is another question that, that I've been getting. Often, again, it's the title company. And they don't really hold them so much, I think, in most cases. And you want to be checking with your title companies about how they handle this in a case-by-case -case basis. But in most cases, I think the title companies uh, push the money to the you know, to the IRS or the Treasury Department, um, and they ultimately hold it uh, on behalf of the seller until the seller files their tax returns. And so how does the seller get their money back? Well, they file taxes on it. And so in most cases, that 15% is more than the amount the, than the actual taxable event that occurred, right? And so the, the seller is going to probably get some refund of some portion of that amount but at least it ensures, because it's essentially being held in escrow uh, in some fashion, that, um, that the seller actually shows up, files their taxes, and justifies whatever um, amount they should be getting returned of that 15%. So again, typically, uh, that's, it's being held by the IRS at that point, and the seller is going to, going to retrieve whatever portion of that they deservedly ought to get back based on their tax filing status. Um, what if the seller needs the funds immediately? In other words, I've got to I've got to close, and I'm, I'm basically putting this money into a new property. It doesn't really matter, and there could basically there could be some sort of 1031 implications and things like that. But the one thing, the FERPTA withholding is going to apply, even if the seller says, "Hey, I need these funds immediately." That's not really a, an exception, and so um, there is a, there is an exception, or there is an ability for a more probably in most cases sophisticated seller to go to the Department of Treasury and get some some pre letter essentially that says. Based on all of the tax computations that we've done, the seller is only going to owe, you know, maybe let's call it, it's only 9% withholding. And so there'll be some certified letter that comes from the Department of uh, Treasury or the IRS that essentially says that, that, that the, uh, uh, that the buyer in that case would be authorized to withhold only 9% or to pay essentially 9%. If you have that, then, then and the seller has done their, their homework ahead of time to get, to get that certified letter from the, from the IRS, then they can avoid the withholding of the full 15% and utilize the money later. But if they don't, haven't done that ahead of time, then that 15% needs to be withheld. Uh, if it's a foreign corporation, same thing applies. Certainly, if it's a foreign corporation, if it's a domestic corporation with a uh, foreign owner, in that case, the burden shifts a little bit, and the actual foreign corporation, like let's say it's a it's a it's a Colorado LLC that is primarily owned by um, a foreign individual. Well, it's actually the LLC, which is a which is an entity that ought to have a tax ID number, a domestic, uh, a domestic tax ID number. And that, in that case, it's the LLC that is the withholding agent. So they would have to be responsible as an American entity for withholding the FERPTA as it relates to the foreign ownership or the fo individual foreign owner of that LLC. So it gets a little bit complicated, I know. And I don't really mean to overcomplicate it, because this is not a new development. I do think that we'll end up having some modifications made to the contract to buy and sell that would include some FERPTA language going forward. Um, the best practice in this case, though, is to determine it early. The worst thing is a situation where a, a seller gets hit with this 
uh, non-foreign status affidavit at the closing table, and they're not expecting this. So it's a reasonable question to be asking of your sellers, and you shouldn't be you know, gun shy about that. Um, and I know there's you know, political sensitivities and everything else to the question, but it is a reasonable question because there are legitimate tax implications to it, and you don't want a seller to get blindsided by the fact that uh, that they're trying to be that, that somebody's trying to withhold 15% of their total proceeds at the closing table. It ought to be discussed much much earlier than that. So so don't be afraid to ask the question. Uh, again, I talk about I think there'll be a new contract clause in 20 in January 2019, beginning January 1st, 2019, when the contract to buy and sell is next revised. Um, I'm hoping that the year after that, when we go back and make changes to the uh, exclusive right to sell listing contract, that we add some language in the listing contract because I think that's even a more appropriate time for a listing agent to be having a discussion about FERPTA provisions with their potential seller at the time of the listing. And then as that might lead to the potential for having an MLS data field that would essentially say foreign seller, yes or no, um, that's gonna make some sense because in the contract, if we, just, if we just write a FERPTA provision into the contract that's checking yes or no to foreign seller, th there's no way that most buyer's agents or buyers as they prepare their offer on the contract form are going to know which box to check. So what I'm concerned about a little bit there is that we end up with um, you know, a seller then having to counter every offer to clarify yes or no on the FERPTA provision. So I, I think that's probably a mistake. In the meantime, I might encourage buyers, because we're talking about this so much more, to have some provision in there that says that, that, that mandates that, that the seller in the additional provisions of the contract that mandates that at closing, the seller agrees to sign one of these non-foreign uh, status affidavits um, just so that they know that if they, they don't end up getting to the closing table and the seller says, hey, I'm not going to sign anything like that or I don't want to provide my social security number. I think if, if a buyer's mandating that or requesting that in the contract and to the extent that it's reasonable, it's going to cut off some of that discussion later on. So anyhow, if you've got more questions about any of that stuff, as always, the Colorado uh, uh, Association of Realtors legal hotline is available and we can try and uh, help you work through some of your FERPTA, FERPTA, FERPTA related issues. Uh, thanks for joining me for another edition and we'll see you next month. Thank <laughs> you.